Hello everyone. So again, uh, welcome back to the latest lecture session. So I guess uh, we introduced ourselves to the concept of the redox reactions last time, right? In the last session anyway. Uh, so we are now going to uh, dig deeper into these reactions and uh, look at the relevant kinetics and then the relevant equilibrium or in if the redox reactions reach equilibrium, you know, what would you expect, I guess, right? And then we look at obviously the relevant applications again, right? So again, uh, before we, uh, you know, dig deeper into kinetics and the relevant aspects, obviously we need to uh, look at some of the basic uh, terms that are, uh, you know, bandied about or thrown about when we talk about the redox reactions, right? So let us look at what they are here. So obviously we have uh, redox reactions, right? Uh, redox obviously what are we talking about? We are talking about oxidation and reduction reactions, right? So whenever someone refers to uh, redox reactions, we are in the more or less obviously talking about uh, oxidation and reduction reactions, which involve the transfer of electrons from one compound to the other, right? Uh, well, it is transfer or you know it is going to be sharing uh, strictly speaking, but we are going to talk about that in uh, relevant detail in the next couple of sessions I guess, right? So here we are talking about uh, electron transfer here with, with respect to redox reaction. So obviously if there is an electron transfer from one compound to the other, the oxidation state of the relevant compound uh, is going to change, right? Or the relevant element is going to uh, or the atom is going to change, right? So again, so here we are going to look at some of the terms. And obviously, you know, uh, we have oxidation and reduction. So, we are going to look at what oxidation is about, right? So, this is the process of donating an electron, right? Process of donating an electron. And again, uh, we see this widely. Uh, we are going to look at uh, it in conjunction with reduction later on, but keep in mind that when we obviously talk about oxidation, it means uh, there is a process of or you know it is uh, leading to uh, donating an electron, right? So, we are going to look at an example I guess of oxidation that we briefly considered in one of our initial classes, right? And glucose and this process let us say is 6 CO2. So, we are now donating the relevant electrons. Right, and for obvious charge balance, you are going to obviously have H plus, right? And here, this release of electrons that we see here in this particular reaction, right, uh, with respect to the glucose, let's say, uh, or you know the other oxidation reactions, uh, can be really uh, partial or complete now, right? So keep that in mind that the electron release can be either partial or uh, complete here. So obviously, uh, this is about uh, oxidation. So if we talk about reduction. And obviously, it is going to be the inverse of this, let us say, right, process of accepting the electron. Right, and relevant example, let us say, you know, let us look at what we uh, usually come across, you know, uh, we always have oxygen present in the atmosphere. So, we let us look at one particular relevant example here, right. So here we are done with it. So more or less oxidation uh, process of donating an electron and with respect to reduction process of accepting an electron, right? So obviously redox reactions. When we refer to uh, redox reactions, we have both the oxidation and reduction reactions uh, going through uh, simultaneously, right? Or occurring simultaneously. Yes. So uh, the re reason why we stress upon simultaneously is that these relevant half reactions, as in half reactions, are those when we write them as the oxidation or reduction here. These are the half reactions where you see either the uh, donation of the electron or the uh, gain of the electron, right? So these half reactions, right? They do not exist in uh, nature, let's say, or in general out there, right? And why is that? Because the electrons, these aqueous electrons, right? They do not accumulate in your particular uh, uh, solutions or such, right? So for a redox reaction to go through, the key is that uh, you should have both oxidation and reduction reactions occurring simultaneously, right? So you'll have a collision or let's say a conductor, right? So that you have the transfer of electrons. Yes. Otherwise, you can't say that okay, uh, let's say my oxidation half reaction is going to go through, and uh, for from time zero to uh, t one, and from t one to t two, my reduction is going to uh, take place. Let's say. Uh, 
uh, based upon the electrons that have accumulated during 0 to time t1 that does not happen because you know electrons do not accumulate uh, in the uh, aqueous solutions right. I mean they have half lives but they are remarkably uh, less. So again for a redox reaction to go through you will always have both oxidation and reduction reactions. So but you usually come across terms like okay this reaction is an oxidation reaction or this particular reaction is a reduction reaction. So what do people refer to I guess. So in that case people are referring to what is happening to the relevant target compound in your particular uh, reaction right. So what do we have now what do we know that a redox reaction is one when oxidation and reduction obviously happen I mean there is an electron transfer right from one compound to the other and we know that they do not occur independently they occur uh, simultaneously or in conjunction with each other right. So, but still people refer to reactions as oxidation or reduction let us say, but why is that because let us say you are people ref are talking about uh, what is happening to the relevant compound here. Their target compound is it being oxidized or reduced and based on that uh, they look at the relevant uh, reactions as oxidation or uh, reductions or such right. So, but keep in mind that they do not occur independently right, right. the whole key is that they do not occur independently right. So, obviously redox reaction is the uh, uh, composite reaction here let us say right redox reaction what is that about overall transfer overall process of transfer of electrons right. So, that refers to the uh, redox reactions right. So, obviously we have two uh, particular oxidation and uh, uh, one each I guess of oxidation reduction. So, let us look at the relevant redox reaction by balancing the number of uh, electrons or look at the balance reaction here I guess right C6H12O6 plus 6O2 right you want to balance the number of electrons right will uh, be in equilibrium with 6CO2 plus 6H2. So, this is a redox reaction right this is a reduction half reaction this is an oxidation half reaction right. So, obviously as you see in the redox reaction you are not going to have uh, or uh, what is any electrons in the relevant uh, equation I guess right. So, again the whole key is that electrons do not accumulate in the solution right uh, for example, so now how would your redox reactions go through now right. Uh, they would go through let us say when one molecule let us say collides with the other and then there is going to be a transfer of electrons let us say. But when this physical uh, collision of the relevant molecules is not uh, feasible let us say uh, one other uh, way that these redox reactions can go through is when you have a conductor of electrons that is what you would see in your electrochemical cells or such right. So, you have a cathode or anode let us say where you have let us say oxidation or reduction at the relevant uh, uh, electrodes and then you have a conductor which is what is the purpose of this conductor obviously for the uh, uh, transfer of the relevant electrons right. Again so let us keep this moving and look at some of the other aspects I guess right. So, here <coughs> we just mentioned that molecule collision is required and why is that again obviously because the oxidation or reduction reactions do not occur independently right. So, this is one particular uh, aspect that you should always uh, keep in mind. So, for example, an analogous uh, uh, reactions or set of reactions would be your uh, acid base reactions there you have let us say transfer of H plus right or the proton. But there though uh, as in, in the acid base reactions you can have the accumulation of uh, H plus or such that is why obviously when you see accumulation or loss of your H plus from the solution right you are going to have a change in the pH right. So, as H plus uh, increases pH decreases and as H plus uh, is removed from the solution or OH minus uh, increases in concentration you are going to see a pH uh, what is increase in pH there right in the acid base it is an analogous uh, kind of analogous set of reactions. But keep in mind that unlike the acid base reactions you cannot have uh, accumulation of electrons and that is the key here right. So, let us move on to some of the other terms. So, you might have heard oxidant right and reducing agent or reductant right 
and in this context uh, similar to what we have for conjugate acid base uh, pair for our conjugate acid base we are going to have a couple here right and then obviously we are going to have electron equivalents I guess right. So, let us look at what these aspects are right. So, again uh, for your redox reactions to go through you know you have what do we say transfer of electrons. So, obviously you need compounds that act as electron acceptors and at the same time if you have an electron acceptor you need a compound that would act as a electron donor. So, here we have the relevant aspects or compounds I guess. So, an oxidant is typically one that would what do we say accept electron. So, that is obviously now going to be an electron acceptor. And as we discussed obviously if you have an electron acceptor right you should there should be a compound uh, available for uh, accepting the uh, for donating the electron pardon me. So, here if oxidant is the electron acceptor reducing agent or reductant is the electron donor right. So, oxidant I guess what does that cause another compound to be. So, it is going to oxidize the other compound. right. So, again oxidant and electron acceptor it is accepting the electron. So, in that process it is oxidizing the other uh, relevant compound right. So, obviously in the same process though the oxidant this particular oxidant is being reduced right. In the process of accepting the electrons right we see that the oxidant is being reduced and obviously one example that we looked at is this particular reduction right. So, oxygen is an electron acceptor that is what you see here and in the process of accepting electron it is being reduced right hopefully it makes sense again. So, one particular uh, what we say oxidizing agent that obviously is ever present is oxygen right and it is an electron acceptor or ox oxidant right. So, and that is the relevant reaction we see out here right. And in the process of accepting the relevant electron right or the electrons or number of electrons which in this case is uh, 4 electrons I guess right. Uh, we see that it is being reduced yes. So, we are done with that again reductant obviously it is going to reduce the other compound other compound right. And let us look at the relevant reaction again that we uh, had earlier and the reducing agent or reductant is in the process being oxidized right. And let us look at what we have just described here. So, here this is the relevant uh, reaction let us say and now obviously you see that this glucose can act as an electron donor and which is what we just described here. So, thus uh, this in this particular case uh, glucose or C6H12O6 is a reducing agent or a reductant right. So, reducing agent is one that would uh, donate the electrons right and in this case we see that the relevant uh, uh, what you say half reaction if you look at the relevant half reaction we can see that glucose can uh, what do we say donate the relevant electrons right. So, that is why uh, in this particular context here I guess uh, glucose is a reducing agent right, but as you see in this process right it is being oxidized glucose is being oxidized right. So, that is what we see and obviously, if we look at this particular uh, composite reaction or the overall reaction I guess what do we see here with respect to this particular case oxygen is oxidizing your particular uh, glucose uh, molecule I guess right. So, oxygen which is an oxidizing agent is oxidizing your particular compound which is glucose in this particular case while being reduced. So, that is what you see here. So, oxygen is acting as the electron acceptor glucose the electron donor and in general because let us say we uh, are our target compound here is this particular glucose molecule I guess right. So, we refer to this particular reaction as oxidation, but in general obviously as you see you have both oxidation and reduction occurring simultaneously right. So, I guess that is one particular aspect here again oxidant is an electron acceptor reductant is an electron donor right. So, couple I guess right. So, similar to the conjugate acid base that we have looked at earlier. So, we have this pair of compounds uh, which would represent let us say before and after exchange of 
uh, electrons let us say right. So, similar to the conjugate acid uh, base pair uh, you know which are what do we say the compounds before and after let us say uh, exchange of the proton or H plus here we have what do we say a couple a redox couple a pair of compounds which would represent uh, what do we say before and after uh, stages of electron transfer. So, obviously here I guess there are different types of couple right different kinds of couples. So, we will come back to that later on. So, again one aspect here is that we need to keep in mind is equivalence. So, we talk about equivalence uh, you know or we talked about or looked at different aspects with respect to equivalence earlier, but most of them are with respect to uh, charge let us say right most of them anyway. And here also we have a relevant concept of equivalence, but here we talk about electron equivalence right not with respect to charge, but I guess the concept is similar right. So, it is the amount of material right that will donate or accept one mole of electrons right. So, obviously, with respect to charge I guess with uh, we define it in terms of uh, per mole of uh, the charge I guess right and here obviously, we are looking at compound that will either donate or what do we say accept one mole of electrons right. So, that we would uh, refer to as electron equivalence. So, obviously, there is a particular uh, example we are going to look at with respect to COD test as in COD it is the chemical oxygen demand right but you are using potassium dichromate to be able to measure this. So, obviously, uh, there is going to be a uh, what do we say transformation in the relevant units from the uh, chromium or dichromate that you measure for its loss to the oxygen demand right. So, that is what we are going to look at later on and in that context we are going to look at electron equivalence uh, later on I guess right. So, again, but one aspect with respect to electron equivalence is that right we are talking about electron equivalence now right. And keep in mind that it can vary now. Why is that? I guess because different compounds, for example, look at this particular examples with respect to sulfide, right? You know, you have this particular case, right? And from this particular aspect, you can identify one set of couple, right? But again, keep in mind that the hydrogen sulfide can also, let us say. And now keep in mind this for this particular half reaction right uh, you have a different couple H 2 S and SO 3 2 minus here you had H 2 S and just sulfur here and another aspect let us say is H 2 S plus 4 H 2 O right and SO 4 2 minus plus 8 electrons I guess plus 10 H plus right. So, here we are we come across examples I guess right 3 examples right wherein let us say the couple right we have the couple I uh, you know it is obviously depend upon the type of half reaction right. So, in this particular case what is the couple H 2 S and sulfur and in the second case H 2 S and S O 3 2 minus right and again in the third case the couple is H 2 S and S O 4 2 minus. So, again uh, I guess the reason why we looked at some of these example is that uh, when we are looking at electron equivalents I guess it also depends upon the uh, half reaction that you are. Uh, looking at I guess right. So, for example, the number of moles that is being uh, donated for H 2 S right is different for this particular reaction and let us say it is 2 electrons here right and it is different here because it is 6 electrons here and different here in the third case because it is 8 electrons here. So, when you are looking at or defining a, uh, what do we say the uh, electron equivalence as in the uh, amount of the material that will lead to a loss or gain of 1 mole of your particular uh, what is this now the electrons right. So, you need to look at or consider that relevant half reaction because for the same uh, compound or molecule you can have different kinds of uh, half reactions right or different half reactions leading to different electron equivalents yes. So, that is the reason that I guess why we looked at this particular set of examples. So, I guess we will now move on to applications let us say right and I guess in this context let us uh, go ahead and look at this particular COD test that we uh, talked about earlier and I guess I want to talk about it in the context of the electron equivalents right. Uh, so, what is this particular uh, COD test about now we know that this is the chemical oxygen demand right. 
right. Uh, so, for example, if I have a certain kind of waste, I want to know uh, obviously let us say because if I discharge it into the waters let us say and it can consume the oxygen uh, dissolved oxygen in the water. So, I want to be able to uh, get an idea about its oxygen demand right. So, in that case obviously people look at uh, biochemical oxygen demand the BOD or obviously uh, COD2 you know chemical oxygen demand right. So, obviously I guess you know uh, we are trying to understand the amount of O2 right that this particular uh, material or let us say the waste would consume let us say if it was let out into the uh, uh, streams let us say or into the nature right. But obviously COD is chemical oxygen demand both biodegradable and non biodegradable fractions are going to be uh, considered or you know uh, looked at in this particular experiment right. Anyway, so again we are trying to uh, understand how much oxygen will this particular material uh, require right or you know uh, consume and what do we mean by consume. For example, here we know that oxygen is an electron acceptor. So, the waste that we are looking at we are uh, more or less I guess we have reduced forms of carbon right you know in our particular wastewater anyway and obviously there are other examples too. So, you have a reduced form of carbon and you have an electron acceptor or an oxidizing agent which is oxygen. So, obviously this particular oxygen will oxidize your particular uh, waste right that uh, or sewage let us say that you let out into your particular uh, uh, nature let us say yes. So, obviously you are concerned with how much oxygen will this particular waste or stream let us say consume because obviously if the dissolved oxygen uh, falls below certain thresholds you are going to affect the aquatic ecosystems. So, uh, what are we doing this particular test for to be able to measure the biodegradable and non biodegradable fractions in terms of the amount of oxygen that they will consume. But how do we do this test though? So, we add potassium or you know the dichromate right in the form of potassium dichromate in your particular uh, what is it now uh, experiment. So, why it is that this is a strong oxidizing agent you know if I wanted to connect the test with O2 the kinetics would be so slow right it would take uh, let us say for considerable time or impractical or infeasible amount of time right. So, obviously we are going to add an oxidizing agent right uh, strong oxidizing agent uh, pardon me and that is going to be let us say Cr2O72 minus and we are also going to add a few catalysts right. Yes, we are going to add catalyst to yes and obviously I guess heat it up to you want to increase uh, the rate of uh, your reactions and such right. And again what is the role of this dichromate here as you see it is accepting electrons right. Again it is similar to oxygen it is an oxidizing agent or it can accept electrons from your particular uh, waste that you are talking about which is either your biodegradable or non biodegradable uh, compounds right. But here because this is a strong oxidizing agent right. And we are going to uh, look at uh, later on why we call a particular compound a relatively strong oxidizing agent or a particular compound a strong reducing agent. I mean they should be similar to what we discussed with respect to acids as in we had strong acids or strong bases or weak acids and weak bases and so on right. So, in this case too we are going to look at I guess relevant similar aspects we are going to have strong oxidizing agents or you know strong reducing agents, but again keep in mind that all these are relative right. So, we are going to look at the relevant uh, redox potential or such, but that is later on though. Again keep in mind that we are just adding a strong oxidizing agent in the form of Cr2O72 minus. So, it can take in a certain what do we say number of electrons right and this let us say is your relevant reaction that you see. So, how do you go about uh, your COD test I guess you either measure the decrease in the Cr2O72 minus I guess the oxidation state is 6 right. You either measure the decrease in chromium 6 or measure the increase in this particular form chromium 3 I guess right the oxidation state chromium 3. So, uh, by calculating the loss of this particular Cr2O72 minus or chromium in its oxidation state 6 you can calculate the number of electrons that this particular solution would require. But to me it makes no sense to calculate the number of electrons for example, a particular uh, what do we say solution can donate I guess right. But I want to be able to understand what happens in the natural system and that means the amount of oxygen that it can consume right. So, here the concept of electron equivalence comes into picture as in you see that for one mole of uh, what do we say oxygen you know it has I guess it can consume uh, 4 electrons or it can accept 4 electrons. But here as you see for one mole let us say here I am going to write that out for one mole of O2 right I have. Uh, 4 electrons or 4 moles of electrons 
being accepted right. But in this case let us say for 1 mole of chromium uh, 6 let us say uh, so CR2 uh, 6 electrons for just 1 CR uh, in its oxidation state of 6 chromium right chromium oxidation state 6 I will have 3 moles or it can accept 3 moles of electrons right yes again and now I want to be able to use this particular information about uh, the amount of chromium 6 that is consumed right to be able to come up with uh, equivalent amount of uh, oxygen that would have been consumed. So, obviously what do I need to look at? I need to look at the electron equivalence right. So, from that aspect obviously how can I uh, go about this? I can say that for 3 moles per liter of oxygen right 4 moles per liter of chromium 6 would be the relevant equivalence right. So, again uh, you want to balance the number of electrons I guess right. So, obviously here what is the electron equivalent here one third of mole of oxygen would lead to uh, accepting one mole of or uh, one fourth pardon me. So, what does this mean one fourth moles of O2 would mean one mole of electrons being accepted and the case of chromium 6 one third of moles of chromium 6 would lead to acceptance of or can accept one mole of electron right the electron equivalence here we express them in terms of electron equivalence. So, obviously from this particular information we know that 3 moles per liter of oxygen right would be equivalent to 4 moles per liter of uh, chromium 6 right. So, that is what we have here and so obviously you say you have a factor of 0 0.75 I guess right and this is what you would use in your COD test to uh, be able to come up with your uh, chemical oxygen demand as in your titrating and then or I guess using the spectrophotometer measuring the amount of chromium 6 that is being consumed. So, by using this particular factor let us say then you are going to uh, come up with an estimation not estimation I guess calculation of how much oxygen is going to be consumed let us say and that is going to be equal to the COD or chemical oxygen demand right. So, that is your particular uh, what is a factor and where do we look at or what do we look at obviously the electron equivalence right. So, now let us look at or start uh, discussing a few of the applications right. So, I believe we are going to look at a few applications here and let us look at redox reactions uh, I guess that you would usually or commonly come across. So, obviously one example that I guess we looked at was in our waste water treatment plants or sewage treatment plants right. So, you have your waste right or your organic form your organics right and now let us try to understand these in terms of the terms that we have uh, uh, you know looked at thus far right. So, organic compounds usually let us say you know C H and O right. So, usually they are uh, reduced forms right they are reduced forms and now we also have oxygen or we add oxygen right you aerate the relevant waste and what is the process uh, wh why is it I guess you are trying to add uh, oxygen which is your electron acceptor right. So, oxygen again is an oxidizing agent and it acts as an electron acceptor and obviously thus your uh, what do we say organic which is in the reduced form will act as a electron donor right. So, now you have the relevant building blocks if I can say that I guess for your redox reaction they are the electron acceptor or presence of an electron acceptor which is the oxygen that you are putting into the waste and your waste itself is the electron uh, donor right. And so, this can you know if you look at complete mineralization I guess transform to CO2 and H2O obviously CO2 is uh, the oxidized form here that you are uh, looking at I guess right. Again uh, here C is in its relatively reduced form and C here is in its more oxidized form. So, what is happening to this particular carbon C as in carbon it is being oxidized by the relevant oxygen. But again in nature though this does not take place uh, at the relevant rates or you know it is not fast enough right and why is that as we discussed the kinetics are relatively slow right. So, what are you doing obviously to you know uh, fasten this process. So, obviously you are going to add your seed uh, right and more or less the microorganisms and what is the role of these microorganisms they produce the enzymes right 
which then act as catalysts, right? Thus, increasing the kinetics of this particular process, right? So that's what you are more or less, uh, you know, leading to, right? And again, keep in mind that uh, why do these microorganisms obviously want to take part in this particular redox reaction? Well, they need to gain some particular benefit too, right? So, in general, let us say energy is released from this particular redox reactions and this particular energy is used either for uh, cell synthesis, uh, growth or such, right? Again, that is the reason why microorganisms would, I guess, want to degrade your particular waste. So, when we say degrade, we are obviously talking about microorganisms, uh, you know, uh, trying to what do we say extract this energy if I can say through this particular redox process, right. So, that is obvious uh, what do we say example that, you know, people at least, uh, you know, uh, look at or can look at, but there are obviously uh, many more applications, right. So, I guess people talk about removing uh, color, let us say, right. And what do you look at again? These are redox process again based on let us say adding reducing agents let us say or if you are looking at dyeing industries let us say color and uh, rivers or you know uh, surface waters uh, that is a different aspect. Again color from your dyeing industry that is again a different aspect. But more or less what do you add? You need an oxidizing agent I guess right and oxidizing agent as in it is an electron acceptor and that again when we are talking about color removal we are in general again obviously talking about your redox process. So, again when people talk about taste, yeah, I guess there is a certain compound that is leading to this particular taste or such and you can add the relevant oxidizing agent or such, uh, let us say to be able to remove this or uh, what do we say oxidize this particular contaminant, right. So, in this context again, you know people come across advanced oxidation process, right. So, advanced oxidation process. And obviously, I guess we are calling this advanced oxidation pr process because we usually lead to or you know these particular AOPs lead to uh, or there are different kinds of AOPs, I guess I should have listed that first. Let us say just ozone if you vary the pH, right, depending on the change in pH and ozone with respect to UV or H2O2 or in conjunction, I guess all three of them and obviously again UV H2O2 process, UV as an ultraviolet, right and H2O2 and I guess Fenton's reagent 2, right, Fe2 plus and H2O2. This can lead to formation of your radicals, more specifically your hydroxyl radical, right. And what is this radical again? It is an unpaired, it has an unpaired electron, right. So, this hydroxyl radical is has an unpaired electron. So, it is remarkably unstable. So, it wants to, uh, what do we say, it trends to uh, you know, uh, it tries very hard, let us say if I can use the layman's terms to accept electrons, right and go to its more stable state which is going to be OH minus, right. So, thus OH radical, right, this is a radical and in this context the radical, let us say is a strong or very strong, very strong oxidizing agent, right. Again, similar to these uh, hydroxyl radicals, depending on the relevant, uh, what do we say, mechanism you look at, you can also produce these reducing radicals, which is the hydrogen radical. And obviously, you know, again, hydrogen radical would want to go to its more stable state, which is H plus, as in it wants to release or donate its electron. Thus, H, uh, the hydrogen radical will act as a very strong reducing agent, right. Again, this is a different aspect. I want to highlight that because here we were talking about the oxidizing agent, which is the uh, hydroxyl radical here, and the hydrogen radical can also be formed in different uh, what do we say process. So again, these AOPs, I guess, have uh, what do we say applications with respect to uh, situations, let's say, when your particular wastes are relatively non-biodegradable. Obviously, if you are using biological process, and let's say your particular wastes are relatively more biodegradable, let's say. Uh, then I guess you know the relevant efficiency of the process is uh, or would be good enough. But let us say if it is not and if you want to increase the efficiency of the process, one way would, do, would be to have pre AOP let us say AOP, right. So, then your non biodegradable wastes, non biodegradable wastes will be transformed after application of these advanced oxidation process into biodegradable wastes, right. So, let us say you have a non-biodegradable waste for which let us say your particular uh, 
uh, ASP or SBR let us say is not that efficient let us say or the kinetic cells uh, taking way too much uh, or way too long or kinetics is relatively slow right and also let us say even your uh, final product is not up to your standard. So, what can you do? Uh, you can either just use advanced oxidation process let us say, but there might be practical uh, limitations with respect to the cost involved. So, with relevant uh, doses of uh, AOP let us say right, you can transform this non-biodegradable waste into biodegradable waste right and then I guess use your biological process to what do we say degrade or mineralize these particular biodegradable waste. So, in effect you are increasing the efficiency of your process. So, I guess again there are many more applications. So, we will look at a few more in the next uh, session and then we will move on to first understanding this concept of oxidation state right. So, we have oxidation states, oxidation numbers. So, what is this and how do we calculate that? I guess it is relatively simple but and maybe people have uh, looked at it in great detail. So, but I guess this is uh, what do we say at the crux of what we are going to look at in this particular say, couple of or set of sessions. So, we are going to look at that in uh, greater detail and I guess with that I will end today's session and uh, we will continue the relevant aspects in the next session and thank you.